Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, another great event that we have scheduled for tonight, a part two of six different presentations. My name is Sharice Polly. I'm the supervisor in the, of social work and attendance counseling services and the mental health lead at the Greater Essex County District School Board. I can't say enough about our great partnership that we have with Maryville and uh, in our partnership in bringing forward these presentations, because certainly these are the issues that we're hearing um, from both, you know, from students and, and uh, parents, that these are some of the struggles that we're all experiencing. So I'm so glad that you're able to join us. So tonight we're actually having, um, her name is Melissa Wirch and she's a psychologist and she's uh, in a supervised practice at Maryville Adolescent and Family Services. And so I wanna welcome her. Melissa, I'm, uh, I'm passing it over to you now. So as uh, Shri said, uh, my name is Melissa Wirch and I'm a psychologist uh, currently in supervised practice at Maryville Adolescent and Family Services. And I just wanted to say thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, the title of the presentation is Coping Together, Creating a Daily Routine. Here's just a brief overview of our uh, caregiver seminar series. So this presentation is the second presentation in the series, and I'll have some information at the end for those who are wanting to learn more about the presentations that are coming up next. Tonight we're going to be talking about daily routines and really focusing on six elements that are important for our health and well-being, uh, including self-care, mindfulness, sleep, nourishing food, exercise and activity, and joy and uh, gratitude. Developing a daily routine can help us to feel more in control of our lives and help us to make room for all that's important. There are some people who love having a solid daily routine and others that like an element of unpredictability each and every day. What we know is that during times of stress and change, Maintaining that structure and routine can actually be quite helpful and can help us to feel more organized and in control. This is especially important when we're faced with certain factors that we simply cannot control, um, such as how long the pandemic is going to last. Uh, recent research suggests that parental, uh, parental burnout is becoming more well known. So parental burnout includes experiencing overwhelming exhaustion due to parenting roles, distancing emotionally from children, and feeling a sense of ineffectiveness as a parent. As of 2018, at least 3.5 million parents in the U.S. were struggling with um, parental burnout. One may speculate that the statistics are probably higher now uh, due to the increasing demands on parents during the pandemic. Signs and consequences of this type of burnout include escape ideation, so that's um, fantasizing of leaving parenting and all of its stressors, uh, maybe distancing from children, and having less patience when trying to manage the many, many responsibilities that parents have. The reality is that with parenting, the demands usually far outweigh the resources to satisfy them, which means and really leads to a depleted battery and limited emotional and mental fuel. So that being said, we really can't give any more than what we have. So for instance, if caregivers are feeling disconnected from themselves, giving love, care and nurturing is going to be difficult. So when under stress, being patient and compassionate will seem like a really monstrous task. So the task really becomes finding ways to refuel the emotional and mental battery that can quickly become so drained. Um, before others can recharge because of you, you really need to focus on recharging yourself, which is um, what the seminar tonight is all about. In an article posted by uh, Dr. Robin Kolotsowicz, uh, who's a clinical psychologist based out of New Jersey. She notes that, ironically, in the pursuit of being a perfect parent, we tend to burn ourselves out. Social media with all of the images of bento box lunches, Pinterest boards of fun braided hairstyles, and parents who brew their own homemade kefir don't help. Let's not be perfect or even great. Let's serve peanut butter and jelly for dinner and have the energy for a cuddle. Let's be real because we can burn ourselves out on the path to trying to be perfect. So this is really where daily routines can come into play and the importance of taking care of yourself and replenishing your emotional and mental battery. A lack of structure and routine can actually increase feelings of distress and may make us actually pay more attention to the sources of our problems. So if we don't have that structure and we're sitting around with less to focus on, for example, this can lead to us thinking about the stressful situation even more and creating additional stress and anxiety for ourselves. 
So routines can help us to cope with change, establish helpful daily habits, reduce stress, improve focus and productivity, take some of the guesswork out of portions of our day, which can help us to feel more in control and better able to manage the surprises that occur. This is really because we're going to have more mental capacity and energy available to us because of the predictability that we've created. And finally, routines can really act as an anchor and keep us grounded, which is especially important during times when we're hit with storms of uncertainty. And when I think about the storms of uncertainty that we're facing right now, I think about the storm, the lightning, the torrential downpour. So really that big, um, that big storm that we're experiencing right now. So a really nice place to start when developing a daily routine is to focus on the things that you can control, such as new routines around self-care, mindfulness, sleep, nourishing food, exercise and activity, and practicing uh, joy and gratitude. The key here is to create a routine that adds structure and the sense of predictability to your day. Um, and we all know that schedules can somewhat change depending on the day of the week or if there are certain surprises that pop up. The idea is really to create and stick to a basic structure for when you wake up, eat, work, do activities, engage in self-care, practice gratitude, and sleep. So the first one is self-care. So self-care means uh, taking care of yourself so that you can be healthy, well, do your job, help and care for others, and do all of the things that you need to do and want to accomplish in a day. If you think you've been hearing more about self-care now, you're right, we're realizing now more than ever just how important it is to really take care of ourselves. Self-care includes all of the steps an individual can take to manage stressors in their life and take care of their own health and well-being. Learning how to be grounded in the moment is an important skill to include in any self-care plan. The ways that each and every one of us engages in self-care is going to be different as this is going to be quite unique to what our own needs are. So some examples that we have here are unplugging for an hour or more. Um, so whether that be putting your phone or your computer on some kind of airplane mode so that there's no bings coming from emails, texts or social media. Reading or watching something that makes you laugh, maybe an old comic strip or a funny video that never fails to crack you up. I know for me, I've been uh, re-watching some past Saturday Night Live clips and um, they never, really never fail to make me laugh. Uh, making a small connection, uh, I think right now we're all really um, in need of, of extra connection. So this might include striking up a conversation with um, maybe a cashier at the grocery store, for example. Asking for help. Uh, when you're starting to feel overwhelmed, take this as a sign that asking for help is going to be important and will likely improve your health and well-being in the long term. Taking time for yourself at the end of each day to unwind and engage in an activity you enjoy. So whether this be an activity you currently engage in or maybe a new activity that you've been really wanting to try. And being kind to yourself by offering yourself uh, self-compassion. So one way to engage in self-care is to give yourself a self-compassion break, and I'm going to lead us through what this break really includes. So I'm going to ask you to think of a situation in your life that is difficult or that might be causing you stress. So think of something that might be more on the, the minor to moderate scale, um, but nevertheless something that is causing you some stress. And I'm gonna ask you to call this situation to mind and see if you can actually feel the stress and some discomfort maybe in your body. And when we think of self-compassion, we really think of three different elements. So the first one is mindfulness and being mindful of the experiences that we are having and where we're feeling them in our bodies. The second one is common humanity, and this really means that we're not alone in things that are difficult or, or experiences that are causing us stress, that this really is um, what makes us human. And the third part is really that self-kindness and being kind to ourselves. So as you call this uh, situation to your mind, I'm going to ask you to say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. And when you say this is a moment of suffering, this is really what mindfulness is. Other options might include this hurts, ouch, 
or this is what stress feels like. And then I'm going to ask you to say to yourself, suffering is a part of life. And when you say suffering is a part of life, this is what is common humanity. Other options might include other people feel this way. I'm not alone and we all struggle in our lives. And now I'm going to ask you to um, either put your hands over your heart or find some way to touch yourself in a soothing way. So sometimes people might put their hands together, put their hands on their lap, maybe put their hands close to their face. Um, do whatever feels the most comfortable for you. And as you find that soothing touch, really feel the warmth of your hands and the gentle touch. So for me, I'm going to put my hand on my chest. And I'm going to ask you to say to yourself, may I be kind to myself? And you can also ask yourself, what do I need to hear right now to express kindness to myself? There might be a phrase that speaks to you in your particular situation. Some others might be, may I give myself the compassion that I need? May I learn to accept myself as I am? May I forgive myself? May I be strong? And may I be patient? And just take a moment and see how that feels for you. This practice can be used really any time of the day or at night um, and, and really helps us to remember the three aspects of self-compassion when we might need it most. So again, self-kindness, common humanity, and mindfulness. The next part of the presentation is mindfulness. So mindfulness is the practice of being fully present in the moment. One way to practice mindfulness is to notice the thoughts that are running through our minds and let them go without judgment. Our minds tend to be pretty busy throughout the day and very, very creative, um, going from one thought really to the next quite quickly. It's up to us to decide which thoughts are helpful and support our health and well being, and which thoughts are unhelpful. In the case of unhelpful thoughts, which there are many, uh, observe them and let them go without judgment. This can help you to make the most of your self-care uh, practice because with this shift in mindset, the benefits of your self-care routine will be amplified and you'll see a boost in your mood. Overall, mindfulness can help relieve stress, improve concentration, lower ruminative thinking, which is so prevalent among all of us, treat heart disease, lower blood pressure, reduce chronic pain, and improve sleep. Some other ways to practice mindfulness right now might be stopping what you're doing, taking a breath, and just focusing on the sensations of your breath, putting down your phone, doing one thing at a time, and really focusing and participating on that one thing, as opposed to um, focusing on multiple things at once, which um, I know for me, I tend to be uh, pulled into the multitasking realm of things. Um, find mindful moments in everyday tasks and notice the moves you already make. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to guide us through a mindfulness practice uh, by stopping what we're doing, taking a deep breath and really focusing on the sensations of our breath. So there's no there's no right or wrong way to practice mindfulness. Whatever you experience during this uh, breathing exercise is what's right for you. Don't try to make anything happen. Really just focus on observing. So I'm going to ask um, that you find a comfortable position. So maybe um, sitting wherever you're sitting, maybe that's putting your feet on the floor, putting your back against your chair, uh, whatever is going to be most comfortable for you. And you can either close your eyes or focus on one spot in the room. And as you're doing that, start by rolling your shoulders. So rolling them slowly forward. And then switching and moving them slowly back. And then you can lean your head from side to side, lowering your left ear towards your left shoulder and then your right ear towards your right shoulder really just focus on relaxing your muscles. 
And as you continue to relax, um, your body will continue to do so as well. And I'm going to ask that you observe your breathing. Notice how your breath flows in and out. Make no effort to change your breathing in any way. Simply just notice how your body breathes. Your body knows how much air it needs. Sit quietly and seeing in your mind's eye, your breath falling gently in and out of your body. When your attention wanders, as it's going to, just focus back again on your breathing. Notice any stray thoughts or things that might pop into your mind and, and don't dwell on them, just let them pass. See how your mind and your breath continues to flow deeply and calmly. Notice the stages of a complete breath from the in-breath to the pause that follows, the exhale, and the pause before you're taking another breath. And even see if you have any slight breaks that are between each breath. Feel the air as it enters through your nose, and you can even picture the breath flowing through the cavities in your sinuses and then down, down into your lungs. And again, as thoughts intrude or they pop up, allow them to pass and return to the, your attention to your breathing. Feel the air inside your body after you inhale, filling your body greatly and gently. Notice how the space inside your lungs becomes smaller after you exhale and the air leaves your body. Notice and feel your chest and stomach gently rise and fall with each breath. Now I'm gonna ask as you inhale, count slowly. One, two, three, and as you exhale, count one, two, three. Wait for the next breath and count again. Exhale, count. Inhale, count. Exhale. Continue to count each Inhale and exhale as one. Notice now how your body feels. See how calm and gentle your breathing is and how relaxed your body feels. And then as we near the end of this exercise, um, now it's time to gently reawaken your body and your mind. So keep your eyes closed still and just notice the sounds around you. If you have your feet on the floor, feel the floor beneath you and maybe even feel your clothes against your body. Start to wiggle your toes and your fingers. Start shrugging your shoulders again. And then when you're ready, open your eyes and remain sitting for a few moments longer. You might wish to straighten out your legs or give your a big stretch with your arms gently. And as you're sitting there, enjoy how relaxed you feel and experience your body reawakening and your mind returning to its usual level of alertness. Thank you for going through this exercise with me. So the next slide here I have is um, Asking if this picture resonates with anyone, um, and I know it resonates with me for sure. Uh, the difference between when our minds are full and on overload versus being mindful and connected um, is really what's needed for our health and our well being. Doing one thing at a time, whether that be a walk or focusing on nature, 
uh, to driving in the car and focusing on the road, other cars or houses being passed by. Being in the present moment is all about doing one thing at a time and participating fully, as I mentioned. In these moments, our minds are likely to wander. And if this occurs, be kind to yourself and just gently bring your mind back to the present moment. The more we're able to practice this skill, the easier it's going to become. So some ways to practice mindfulness every day, observing your breathing as we just did, savoring every bite while you eat, listening to soothing music, reading a book, going for a walk, and noticing the sounds, the sights, and the smells, organizing something at work or at home, and maybe even writing in a journal. And for all of these examples, it's important to engage in the activity fully using all of your five senses. And again, if your mind wanders, as soon as you realize it, note what distracted you and re-engage in what you're doing. I have an example here of um, a way to practice mindfulness during a daily routine. So um, it might include picking an activity that constitutes a part of your daily morning routine, for example. So that might be brushing your teeth, uh, making the bed or taking a shower. And when you do it, totally focusing your attention on what you're doing. So the body movements, the taste, the touch, the smell, the sight, the sound and so on. Notice what's happening with an attitude of openness and curiosity. For example, when you're in the shower, maybe noticing the sounds of the water as it sprays out of the nozzle, um, as it hits your body, and then as it goes down the drain. Noticing the temperature of the water and the feel of it in your hair, on your shoulders, and running down. Noticing the smell of the soap or the shampoo that you might be using, and feeling them against your skin. Noticing the sight of the water droplets on the walls or on the shower curtain, the water dripping down, and maybe even the steam rising upward, depending on how warm you like your showers. Even notice the movements of your arms as you wash or scrub or shampoo. And when thoughts arise, just acknowledge them and let them come and go like passing cars. So again and again, you'll get caught up in your thoughts. And as soon as you realize that this has happened, again, acknowledge it, note what the thought was that distracted you and bring your attention back to the shower. So I have to say, I've never been this mindful when I've taken a shower. So I think this might be um, a task for many of us. <laughs> the next important uh, component of a daily routine is sleep. So sleep hygiene refers to healthy sleep habits. Good sleep hygiene is important because of how crucial getting good sleep is for our mental and physical health, as well as our overall quality of life. Your behaviors during the day, not just before you go to bed, can really affect how well you sleep. A proper amount of sleep has been known to lower uh, risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, obesity, and Alzheimer's. And sleep can also keep your energy levels up, improve your mood, and fight off any symptoms of anxiety and depression. So we prepared a sleep quiz here um, with a few questions. The first question is, uh, so first things first, do people really even need to sleep? And the answers we have here are, adults don't typically need to sleep. We've just been trained to sleep from infancy. Oh, we need it all right. Things usually get pretty dicey after a few nights of no sleep. Or number three, sleep isn't an absolute necessity, but it's important if you want to be in top health. So I'll give you a few seconds and uh, to think about what your answer would be. So the correct answer is number two. So um, although your comforter might be super snuggly, that's not the real reason for curling up in bed. A night or two of skipping sleep can cause someone to have trouble concentrating and can cause us to be more irritable, moody, and depressed. Three days with no sleep can actually cause uh, someone to hallucinate. Question two is, now that we know we need sleep, any idea why? 
You sleep to get rid of the tired feeling and recharge your batteries. There's nothing else to it. You sleep so you don't age as quickly. More time asleep means more years on the old biological clock. And three, it's a little more complicated than that. Right now the jury's out, but they've got some promising ideas. So what does everyone think for this one? The correct answer is actually number three. So no one's 100% sure why the body must have sleep, but there's a few offerings. Sleep gives our bodies times to heal themselves and replace old cells. It decreases how much energy we need to consume so we don't need to eat so much, and it lets new memories get organized and archived. Number three, so besides a band, what is REM or REM? So REM is the period of sleep during which brain waves hit levels similar to what you experience when awake. REM is the period of sleep when your brain waves are at their slowest levels. And how should I know? I don't sleep, I dream. What does everyone think for this one? So the correct answer is actually number two. So REM or rapid eye movement is the period of sleep when brain waves can speed up to levels matching those when you're awake. This is when most dreaming happens and REM is critical for a restful sleep. Question four is how often do we experience REM sleep versus non-REM sleep? In an ideal night, REM sleep occurs 20 to 25% of the time. In an ideal night, REM sleep occurs five to 10% of the time. And in an ideal night, REM sleep occurs 45 to 50% of the time. So the correct answer is number one. So assuming you haven't uh, consumed any alcohol or caffeine too late in the evening, you should experience about 20 to 25% of REM sleep a night uh, split up into three to five sessions. Question five, uh, reptiles, mammals, and birds are all examples of animals that sleep, but do they all dream? Sure do. Every species that zonks out automatically has dreams. Nope, you've got to be a mammal to dream. Or some do, some don't, but it's not just us enjoying cinema in our slumbers. What do we think? So the correct answer is number two. All mammals dream and some birds even dream a little. Sadly, reptiles like your snoozing snakes and curled up chameleons probably aren't visiting dreamland. Second last one, how much time does the average person spend dreaming during their lifetime? About four years, about six years, or about eight years? The correct answer is number two. An average person with regular sleeping habits will spend about a third of their lifetime sleeping, but they'll also be dreaming for about six whole years. And I was pretty shocked when I read that. That's a lot of time to be spent sleeping and dreaming. And the last question we have is more than half of kids between ages 14 and 17 report, I don't need to sleep, I have too much to do sleeping less than the doctor recommended eight to 10 hours per night, or sleeping more than the doctor recommended eight to 10 hours per night. What do we think? So the correct answer is actually number two. In a study conducted over six years ago, uh, with more than a million participants, it was found that kids between the ages of 14 and 17 reported sleeping less than the doctor recommended eight to 10 hours per night. Teenagers were the most likely to report sleepiness than other age groups and symptoms of insomnia, such as difficulty falling and staying asleep, increased as children grew older. So some ways to improve sleep, um, there's various things that we can do, such as prioritizing sleep. And I'm sure for many of us, it's tempting to skip sleep to focus on work or getting things done around the house. However, treating sleep as a priority is important and will help to replenish your caregiver battery. Experts recommend determining a fixed sleep time based on when you wake up and sticking to this at bedtime. 
Having a consistent bedtime routine can help your mind and body wind down and adjust to bedtime. Giving yourself 30 minutes to wind down each night. So this might include listening to soothing music, reading a book, or engaging in a relaxation exercise or something that um, speaks to you and, and fits for you and your lifestyle. Um, trying and building in a 30 to 60 minute pre bedtime buffer when you can shut down your electronics and wind down on mental stimulation is something that has been recommended by uh, experts in sleep. And finally, cutting down on caffeine in the afternoon and evening can help you to feel more restful in the evenings. So I typically recommend um, some kind of herbal tea, uh, which can support sleep and help us to feel more relaxed in the evenings. And these are all strategies that can help to promote that REM sleep, which helps to stimulate areas of the brain that really are essential in learning and making or retaining memories. The next category or element of a daily routine is nourishing food. So when we're feeling blue, we might crave calorie rich, high sugar foods to try to lift our spirits. And while this might give us what uh, is tend to be called a sugar rush, it's unlikely to help us in the long term and may actually have negative consequences. Research indicates that the initial boost of energy can last about 15 to 40 minutes before there's that inevitable crash, which leaves us with less energy than before we ate. And because foods high in sugar take energy to digest and our bodies are really getting minimal nourishment from them, um, that's one reason as to why we might be left feeling extra sleepy or groggy afterwards. And instead really aiming for wholesome foods, so whether that be fruit, vegetables, whole grains, dairy and protein for most of the time, and then focusing on fun foods. So that might be things like ice cream, cookies and chips in moderation has really been shown not only to boost our mood, but also our overall health. Research also suggests that there are nine foods that can boost our moods. So dark chocolate, because it's rich in compounds that might increase those feel good chemicals in our brains. Fatty fish uh, like salmon, which are rich in omega-3 fatty acids, which might lower risk of depression. Fermented foods, because about 90% of our body serotonin, which is called the happy chemical, is produced in our guts. A healthy gut is actually being shown to have some kind of connection or correlation with a good mood. So some fermented foods might be um, kimchi, yogurt, kombucha, and even sauerkraut, which are rich in probiotics that can support gut health. Bananas, which are a great source of natural sugar, vitamin B6, and prebiotic fiber, which work together to keep our blood sugar levels and mood more stable. Oats can provide fiber that can help stabilize blood sugar levels and boost mood. They're also high in iron, which can improve mood symptoms in those with um, an iron deficiency. And berries, which are rich in uh, disease fighting elements and can help lower risk of depression. And the last three, uh, nuts and seeds. Certain nuts and seeds are high in tryptophan, uh, zinc, and selenium, which can support brain function and lower risk of depression. Coffee can actually pro uh, provide numerous compounds, including caffeine and uh, chlorogenic acid, which can boost mood. And research suggests that uh, decaf coffee can even have this effect. So again, if, if you're someone who prefers a cup of coffee in the afternoon or in the evening, uh, turning to decaf can actually provide you with some benefits as well. And the last one is beans and lentils, which are um, also rich sources of mood boosting nutrients, uh, particularly those B vitamins that we all need. The next element to consider is exercise and activity. So exercise promotes chemicals in the brain that improve mood and make us, to uh, make us feel more relaxed. Specifically, the brain releases those feel good chemicals called endorphins throughout the body and that decreases stress hormones such as cortisol. Research suggests that physical activity can reduce anxiety and depressed mood and actually enhance self esteem. Physical activity can also push us to really stay in that present moment and keep our minds off of difficulties that uh, we're experiencing. 
Some examples of exercise and activity include uh, walking. So that might be walking alone, walking with friends or family, or walking the dog. I've tried walking my cat before, but uh, that didn't work too well. So <laughs> might have to stick to another animal for that one. Aerobic exercise, which might be running, cycling, swimming, or dancing. Uh, yoga. Tai Chi. Playing a sports game with a friend, so whether that be something that's on the more competitive side or something that's on the more fun side. Uh, it's a nice way to have exercise and activity as well as that social connection piece. Something for when it was more snowy outside, but building a snowman. And even daily household chores like sweeping, shoveling the driveway, cutting the grass with a push mower or gardening are all ways that we can um, incorporate some exercise and activity into our daily routine. And the last element we have here is uh, joy and gratitude. So when we express gratitude and receive the same back, our brain releases dopamine and serotonin, which are two crucial neurotransmitters responsible for our emotions, and they really do make us feel good. They enhance our mood immediately, making us feel happy from the inside. Research shows that grateful people tend to be happy and healthy. They exhibit lower levels of stress and depression, cope better with adversity and sleep better, and they tend to be happier and more satisfied and fulfilled uh, with life. Even their partners tend to be more content with their relationships. Some ways to practice joy and gratitude on a daily basis, or why this is important, I guess, on a daily basis, I should say, is because it promotes a healthier lifestyle. It can boost our immune system. It can help to fight off stress and pain. It increases our satisfaction in relationships and supports our long-term health and well-being. Some examples of ways to practice joy and gratitude might include uh, gratitude exercises. So that might be writing five things you're grateful for at the end of each day, or reflecting on writing about uh, your favorite moment from the day, for example, whatever feels right for you. Creating a gratitude board of things that you're grateful for in your life, which might include pictures of people, special quotes that really speak to you, or pictures of activities that um, are special to you that you engage in. Scheduling a time to reflect on your life each morning. So this might include thinking of the positive and negative experiences that you've had in your life and really grounding these experiences in the present moment by reflecting on how far you've come. Paying attention to the little things in life. So this kind of ties into the the mindfulness element as well. So this might be listening to the birds chirping in the morning, um, noticing that your child put the dishes away without being asked. Uh, those are all times when um, we can uh, practice that gratitude. And telling someone you're grateful for something they did, even if it was a long time ago. And doing something kind for someone in your life. So maybe making them dinner or making them a thank you card. We all express gratitude in different ways, so finding a way that's unique to you. And within this, um, volunteering can be a wonderful way to practice gratitude and to give back to the community. And volunteering can even be something that you do by yourself, or it's a nice way to schedule a family activity to all give back. A note on smiling. So according to Dr. Diana Samuel, who's an assistant professor of clinical psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center, smiling can trick your brain by elevating your mood, lowering your heart rate, and reducing your stress. The smile doesn't have to be based on real emotion because faking it works as well. So some refer to this as the half smile and suggest that the Mona Lisa might be a good person to look to for guidance. So just a little smile can go a long way in elevating your mood. And if you're feeling down, activities uh, like going for a walk in nature, petting a, an animal such as a dog or a cat, kissing a loved one, and yes, even forcing yourself to engage in that half smile can help those neurotransmitters to do their job and raise your mood. So where to go from here? A really key part to supporting our health and well-being is to live in line with our values. Values represent really our heart's deepest desires for how we want to live as human beings. 
The term valued living means having an, an idea about what we want out of life and then making a commitment to ourselves to take action in service of those values. So if we can truly embrace valued living, we're forever really going to be moving in that direction of our values. And values are unique to each and every one of us. There can often be, um, I'll say maybe a social pressure or the looming shoulds or have tos that impact where we spend our energy. So I should do this, I shouldn't do this. Oh gosh, I'm not a good parent because I did this instead of this. Um, so really determining your values is between you, you and you only. If you find yourself beating yourself up in the process of determining your values, I really encourage you to take a step back, ground yourself and remind yourself that this is a helpful exercise in choosing how to move forward and what to focus on to create really the fulfilling life that we are all worthy of and, and that we all deserve. So some examples of overarching values might include uh, family, intimate relationships, parenting, friends or social life, work, education and training, recreation and fun, spirituality, community life, self-care, creative expression, honesty, uh, authenticity, optimism, etc. So there are literally hundreds of different values and many tap into the personal qualities or character strengths. So this is a pretty exhaustive list and not all of them are going to be relevant to you. So Dr. Russ Harris, who's a leading expert in the field of acceptance and commitment therapy, indicates that there's no such thing as right values or wrong values. And he mentions as, that it's a little bit like our taste in pizza. So if you prefer ham and pineapple, and I prefer artichoke, sun-dried tomatoes, and red onion, which I'm told is not the preferred ingredients for a pizza by many. That doesn't mean that um, my taste in pizza is wrong or right, and yours is wrong or right. It just means that we have different tastes. So, and similarly, um, we may have different values. So one way to clarify your values is to go through this list and identify what your values are or what you would describe as very important to you, uh, quite important or not so important to you. And I would encourage everyone to identify um, a few values that are within the very important category. And here's a second list of also some personal qualities and character strengths. So once you're able to identify the values that are very important to you, write down three or more actions that define what it would mean to live these values. So for instance, uh, for someone who values family, actions might include connecting with certain family members on a daily or weekly basis, scheduling a family connection night where everyone engages in an activity together, or even living close to family members. For someone who values self-care, in particular physical self-care, someone may put an extra focus on supporting their physical health through activity, sleep, and nourishing food. And finally, for someone who values loyalty, actions might include forgiving a friend for a betrayal or choosing to stay loyal to a spouse or even a pet. And remember, the actions that go along with each value are going to be unique to you. So what works for um, what works for you may not work for someone else. We're all different in terms of our genetics, our personalities, our environments and our circumstances. So establishing a daily routine that works and is unique to you is important. So I really encourage everyone to reflect on their values and determine if there's certain elements that we've discussed today. So going back to the self care, mindfulness, sleep, exercise and activity uh, and practicing joy and gratitude that might be important to incorporate into your daily routine. And as time continues, check in with yourself and reflect on the wonderful changes that you've made. Offer yourself kindness as you continue to work to support your health and well-being during these very difficult and different times. 
And if you're interested in learning more about our caregiver uh, seminar series, uh, you can check out the Maryville website or the public board website. And um, we have a flyer with the different uh, seminar topics as well as a brief overview of what each um, seminar is going to discuss and focus on. And if anyone is interested in checking out uh, any of the references that um, were incorporated into this seminar, I've included them at the end of the presentation. I just want to say thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. Um, I really appreciate you taking this time out of your day and I think it goes to show that this is an element of self-care in and of itself.